Today on Business World, a closer look at the GI Bill. The GI Bill was created to help veterans of World War II. It established hospitals, made low interest mortgage available, and granted stipends covering tuition and expenses for veterans attending college or trade schools. From 1944 to 1949, Nearly 9 million veterans received close to $4 billion from the bill's unemployment compensation program. The education and training provisions existed until 1956, while the Veterans Administration offered insured loans until 1962. The Readjustment Benefits Act of 1966 extended these benefits to all veterans of the armed forces, including those who had served during peacetime. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was determined to do better for veterans returning from World War II. He also wanted to expand the middle class and help prevent economic turmoil. He started preparing for the veterans' return well in advance of the end of the war. The bill went to Congress in January 1944 as the war still raged along the European and Pacific fronts. It was hotly debated in both congressional houses but finally approved in mid-June. President Roosevelt signed the GI Bill into law on June 22, 1944. As a result, almost 49% of college admissions in 1947 were veterans. The GI Bill opened the door of higher education to the working class in a way never done before. The government guaranteed loans for veterans who borrowed money to buy a home. These loans enabled thousands of veterans to abandon city life and moved to mass-produced cookie-cutter homes in suburbia. This mass move from major cities would help shape America's socioeconomic and political landscape for the years to come. Thank you for watching MDC TV. Welcome back to Business World. Today, our guest is Professor Richard Tapia. He's a professor of political science and international relations here at Miami Dade College's North Campus. Professor, good to see you again. Thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure always to be here at Business World. So we're talking today about the GI Bill. Uh, Professor, what was the impact of the GI Bill being passed uh, in terms of how many people, how many veterans entered college as a result of that bill? Well, in, in 1944, when Congress passed what, what is commonly referred to as the GI Montgomery GI Bill, it basically enabled close to 8 million Americans, 8 million veterans to be able to attend, wow. to go to higher education. Now, that's divided between the 2.2 million American veterans that were able to go into higher education, whether it was a bachelor's degree or a graduate education, and another 5 million, actually about 5.5 to 5.6 million that was able to get vocational technical training, which in many ways empowered the middle class like never before. Before, attending college or a university was really for the middle class or the upper middle class, and it really wasn't accessible to the working class. But following the Great Depression, mm -hmm. Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Montgomery GI Bill in, into law, and it, it was intended to have multiple effects. One is provide economic opportunities, especially when it comes to training and later employment for veterans that are coming back from the Second World War. But it also allowed for the working class to be able to access education through military service. Now, this, was, this came about because of what had happened during the First World War, where many veterans were disenfranchised. Many decided to protest during the Hoover administration at the Capitol. And it led to President Hoover refusing to give any type of concessions and really ordered U.S. Army troops to remove the veterans from the Capitol in the 1930s in the midst of the Great Depression. So many, many World War I veterans that had served our country during World War I came back and were now suffering the effects of the Great Depression. They didn't have training. They didn't have access to training when it comes to college education or right. even being able to pay vocation or technical training. And instead of the government giving any type of concession, they basically called the army on American veterans, which ended up being a very dark chapter of American Absolutely. history. So when FDR became president of the United States, Congress wanted to prevent that. And they wanted to make sure that returning veterans that came back from the service, from serving honorably in the Second World War, right. would be able to access higher education. Also, the fear was, and many Keynesian economic mm -hmm. theorists of the time believed that with such a large number of service members coming back, unemployment was going to go up, right. and this was going to have a detrimental effect on the economy. 
Right. And also, uh, part of the GI Bill was providing loans for veterans to be able to buy a house. And I think that's why, Correct. Uh, even to today, many people, you hear many people say, oh, join the military and you get a free house. I mean, I think that's where it comes from, correct? And correct. And a, a lot of veterans moved from the city, they moved to the suburbs into what they call cookie cutter homes. Uh, what impact did that have in terms of uh, social or, econ or political landscape? Well, it, it created the middle class here in America, and, right. and you're absolutely right. The Montgomery GI Bill had multiple parts to it. One part was to provide college and university and technical and vocational training for returning veterans. There was also an unemployment unemployment assistance part to it right. and also mortgage and housing. So what, what ended up happening is as veterans returned, the fear mm -hmm. was that you have this returning workforce right. and now unemployment's gonna go, is gonna basically rise, you're gonna have greater economic uncertainty, but Really, the Montgomery GI Bill, the success of the Montgomery GI Bill, wasn't that it prevented Americans from entering the workforce, but quite the opposite. More Americans were able to enter the workforce with college and vocational training than ever before. But really, it was only about 8 million, like I said previously, right. out of 12 to 20 million returning veterans that took advantage of the Montgomery GI Bill during that time period of 1945 right. to about 1960. Now, the Montgomery GI Bill allowed right. for people who got an educational background to have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree right. to be able to obtain professional employment, obtain technical employment, and it enabled them to move into the middle class. It also enabled them to be able to take out very affordable mortgages right. and basically buy homes and be able to access financing at a cheaper interest rate, which empowered the middle class. What also allowed this movement towards the suburbs, the creation of the middle class, which allowed for the American economy to really triple. I mean, many Keynesian economic <clears throat> theorists believe that the end <throat> of the Second World World War was going to bring about maybe another recession. And even though the economy kind of stalled for a bit, what you ended up seeing from 1945 to 1960 is the GDP of the country tripled. And a lot of that had to do with the housing boom that had taken place, automobiles, the number of automobiles by the Kennedy administration right. went up to about 60 million. So you're talking about a major movement within the economy. Now, during the Eisenhower administration, you see the creation of the highway system, which enabled people to be able to live in the suburbs while working in the cities. Now, the highway enabled that because you could basically go from your home into the city within 15 minutes. Right. So now you had more land available and you have, let's say, the suburbs emerging, like you said, the cookie cutter homes, right. which were cheaper, more affordable, right. they were bigger, and they were more aesthetically pleasing, and you tended to have communities of newer families beginning to move in and you right. had the baby boom. So. The Montgomery GI Bill was really fundamental in allowing this economic expansion. In fact, a lot of people talk about government assistance of mm -hmm. expanding an economy. Right. The Montgomery GI Bill was, was definitely a part of that. But to say that just government assistance brought about this expansion would not be fair because at the same time, right. the government really allowed for new free market new free market principles to Absolutely. work after the wartime, after the wartime Absolutely. period, and this allowed for economic expansion. So we can say that the GI Bill opened the door of higher education to the working class like never Correct. before, right? Correct. As a result, is, can we quantify that? Is there like a certain number of uh, veterans that applied to college as a result of the GI oh, Bill? Absolutely. 2.2 million from 1945 to about 1960. That's amazing. Right. That's, right. that's huge. That's right. for college and university education. And then another 5.6 million that right. were able to get vocational technical training. So during that time period alone, right. about 8 million veterans were able to get, let's right. say, college, vocational, and technical training. Now, today, mm -hmm. we've expanded on the Montgomery GI Bill. You have right. the Forever GI Bill, which right. Congress has reauthorized, making it permanent. And you have more Americans being able to access higher education. Now, the question becomes, what is the return on investment on that investment of the Montgomery GI Bill. And you can look this up on the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. You can sure. look this up according to congressional reports by the Congressional Budget Office. For every $1 we invested in the Montgomery GI Bill, we got seven to $8 worth of return back. Wow. The Warden School estimates it at, Warden School at the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. estimates the number at $8 of return on investment for every dollar we invest. Congress is a little bit more conservative, saying $7 for every $1 that you invest. If you think about the types of investments, if you're a hedge fund manager and you're getting $7 for every $1 back. And also, so, so what impact does it have moving all those veterans to suburbia, right? right. In terms of politics, because I know politics, uh, it, it works with like, the congressional districts, 
like moving more of a population to suburbia, does that, did that open up like new, uh, more people in the census, therefore they had to open up more districts perhaps? Again, the number of districts are set by Congress. We've had 435 congressional districts in the House of Representatives since 1925. However, what it did do, it really did change okay. the dynamics of urban and suburban politics. It was okay. the rise okay. of suburban America, Main Street America, in many ways. Now, it solved a lot of problems in the urban areas. The urban areas, the inner cities, had a lot of problems when it came to overcrowding, when it came to health care, when right. it came to education. And moving to the suburb, suburbs really did alleviate that overcrowding. It did alleviate right. many, many of the problems. But it created a new problem. And what, what had taken place is that the middle class and the wealthier parts of America moved out to the suburbs, which became bedroom communities. And the core city, mm -hmm. which was the inner city, where most of the jobs were at, found themselves with the poorest people in America, however, with the least amount of the tax base because most wow. of the tax base okay. at the local level right. comes from sales tax or property taxes. Depending on the state, you may, stay, you may have a state or even a city income tax, like in the case of New York. So New York settled this problem of, let's say, the middle class or the wealthier parts of the community moving to the suburbs through a city income tax and a state income tax. In the case of the state of Florida, our right. state constitution says that we cannot have a state income tax. We have a federal income tax, but there's no state or city income tax. That leaves local communities completely dependent on a sales tax and a property tax. There's other types of taxes, excise taxes, right. but mainly relied on property and sales taxes in order to provide right. for services to the community. What, so you may yeah. have the city of Miami, like in our case, the city of Miami yeah. that provides mm -hmm. many of the jobs in the downtown. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of these jobs have moved out into the suburbs and into other parts like the Rao and so forth. Right. But for a very long time, downtowns is where most of the jobs were at, but most of the people lived in the bedroom communities. Right. They would live either in Westchester, in Kendall, right. in some of the other surrounding right. neighborhoods right. where a lot of the wealth was located and the property tax revenue stayed within those bedroom communities, within right. the cities mm -hmm. surrounding the core city of the city of Miami. And then you had the poorest of the poor living in the city of Miami. One year in 2001, mm -hmm. Miami was considered the poorest city in America with over 33% of the population living at the poverty line or below it. Right. And the city of Miami that had the neediest right. residents did not have the tax base to provide for right. greater health care when you're talking about roads, when you're talking about parks, police, fire, right. and great, other services. Great. Right. Well, We'll end it on a, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, right. great point. We'll pick it up next time. I would love to uh, have you back and uh, continue this, uh, th this discussion. Thank you for watching MDC TV on Comcast Channel 78 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. And please be sure to visit our website at mdc.edu slash mdctv where you can watch previously recorded episodes. We'll be right back. Our next guest is an immigration attorney with a remarkable number of victories on behalf of her clients. She has litigated cases throughout the United States. She is a regular featured expert on immigration issues on several television stations, including Telemundo, Mega TV, and CBS4. Please welcome Myra Jolie to the show. How are you? <laughs> 
Muy bien, muy bien. Thank you, thank you for having me. You're guys. welcome. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I've seen you so many times on television. Yeah. And you, you truly know what you're doing. You are an expert in, in immigration, and that's why we have you here today. Well, it's easy mm -hmm. to talk about what we know. Right. And then, you know, being practicing for so long and then being in the ins and outs of immigration, that the real deal. Right. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it get to the point that you really uh, know your way out, actually. Good, good. So you, you know all the nuance, nuances of immigration. How, how long have you been practicing? I've been practicing since 2001. Wow, so you have you a lot of... Fully immigration, because I right. am licensed um, in the state of Louisiana. Right. And uh, so I can practice federal law, which is uh, immigration. Right, right, which is very matters. specialized. In specialized everything, yeah. And I, I think that's I think that's a trend in today. I think that we need people that are just specifically good at one thing, in, yeah. in, instead of being like a jack of all trades. Yeah, because who whomever <laughs> is good in everything is just good at nothing. Right, because spread out. Can, you cannot be a, a general practitioner when it comes to immigration right. or to law in right. general. You have to you have to really be a specific specifically yeah. being, being good at something. And yeah. immigration, it may look like it's simple. Some attorney said, may, mm. may say, well, you know, I'm going to try immigration. It's just following, you know, following some regulations and right, filling right. out paperwork. Right. But it's more difficult than that because right. they, the future of families, they are laying on your hand. Period. Yeah. And you have to know how to navigate. It doesn't say that you have to mm -hmm. guarantee any results, but at right. least you know that you give it all you got. And you right. you really represented right. your yeah. clients to the best of your abilities. And, and that's a good point. You can't, no one, no one in any field can control the outcome. But what you can control is your performance. Correct. Right? And then if you, if you do the, the right thing at the right moment, you perform all the way through, by and large, that creates the desired uh, outcome. Outcome, right? exactly. And right. not always, <clears throat> all the, all the ends are going to be having a, a green card. Um, right. Sometimes people have um, ex expectations of what right. it is that the attorney can do for their cases. Right. Once they, they come to the attorney, mm -hmm. a lot had happened in the case. And then oh, okay, it's a matter okay. of just to try to establish that immigration status. Nobody say for how long. Right. Sometimes the cases are like ter they turn beautifully, and we can get the results that we really want for right. uh, for the client. But it's, it's a cooperation. Right. It has to be a participation of both parties, right. and with the expectations within limits. Right. Because some clients, they come to me and they say they had a dream that God told them that I was going to be the savior, and they, they run with it. Now, yeah. in the beginning, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a religious person. I'm a right. Catholic person, and I understand right. what it is to have, you know, this God yeah. feeling that, that, you know, that, you, you that, put every, all your trust sure. in someone. But when that trust, <clears> that <throat> someone is interpreting that trust as right. if it was a guarantee, now we have to just put, you know, the religion right. aside, and this is what's going to happen in your case. Absolutely. Like you said, there's, there's religion and then there's a process. There's a process. There's a process, there's a process that needs like, to be followed. Right? Exactly. And we so have I, to be yeah. realistic. Right. Because Im immigration right. is very sat very satisfying right. uh, a, a, a part of the legal the legal mm -hmm. profession because right. at that point you know you know like a, uh -huh. a, a family attorney yeah. is representing uh, one of the parties who want to break up a family that's scary uh, that's you very know, scary a, a criminal yeah. attorney is representing somebody who wants to break the law right. there's big but in this case right. immigra in, in immigration the attorneys are representing someone who Let's be honest, broke the law. Some, that person broke Interesting. the immigration law because right. I, otherwise there would be no need for, the, for an attorney. So there was, a, right. there was a breaking of something at some point or somebody's, somebody's regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, crossing the border is not legal, that is not acceptable and is not allowed. Because right. we have to respect the boundaries, and right. countries have our, our countries because of because they have fought for their right. independence and for keeping their bo their borders safe. So, right. going from that point, I I truly believe that being an immigration mm -hmm. attorney is not advocating for breaking up the law the same way no, no, a right. criminal attorney cannot be advocating for more criminals on the street. That's a great point, right? Yeah. You know, we don't want anybody to die, but the right. owner of the funeral home wants the people who die to go to him. But it's not that they want people to die. So in this case, I don't want people right. to break the law. But the people that are in the, in the United States who we can find a way to keep them here legally, we will by all means work with them. And, and but not with the people that is not, they're not here yet. 
We cannot be encouraging people to break the law and come to the United States. Right. We are working with the people that are inside the United States because I, and, we understand that they already ingrained. And right. they, My, Myra, on that note, uh, approximately how many people are inside the United States that well, are not legal? Okay, you see that this is the magic number of 11 million. But, is it but never goes up or down or anything. That's a great point, right? At one point, mm -hmm. I said, give it, a, give it a number close to 19 when I was running for, mm -hmm. for Congress. I said, it's going to be more than 19 to 21 million. That are Some here, people that are here, say, that are here, here illegal. Um, and I don't want to... Uh, illegal. I, okay, so I don't want to get into the semantics of it, but yeah, it's here, illegal. undocumented or illegal or, or whatever the semantic is, but there's 19 million people, you're saying, Correct. that yes. are not... Uh, legal that don't have legal status in Those the United don't have any legal status the thing wow. is at that point people say oh yeah because you counter you have something I mean right. just logically mm -hmm. and now it's getting closer to that number even more at, at that number wow. is being wow. increasing even more and we have to um, stop being so so a uh, soft in the way we right. we call you know the name we give if somebody's undocumented, that person doesn't have a, any legal status, so that person is illegal. It, my my father-in-law used right. to say, "You can call me any you, anything you want, but do not call me late for mm. dinner." At the end, don't call me for what? I'm sorry, for don't call me late for oh. dinner. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You can okay. call me anything you want, but don't, don't call, call me late, late for I like, dinner. I like that. Okay. So calling, <laughs> uh, trying to put all our energy and, right. and just saying, "Don't call him illegal. Call him." Uh, you know, alien or foreigners or undocumented. Well, I mean, you know, it doesn't okay. resolve their I see, situation. I see your point. Right? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't but resolve I, their I, situation. But, 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 I, um, mm -hmm. but you have, but you, you would admit that both sides are guilty are, gu are guilty of politicizing the, the, the issue. Yeah, both both sides are yeah. guilty politicizing the right. issue, and none right. of them are willing to right. resolve the situation because otherwise, what are they going to be talking about? Well, that's, that's, right. that's the political part, right? Because yeah. the, ar like, the arguments that I've heard is, well, you know, who are those 11 or 19 mm -hmm. billion people Maybe. likely to vote for? And then what, what I've heard uh, is that they're unlikely to vote for the Republicans. And they're more likely to vote for Democrats. But the, that's just one of the many arguments that yeah, I've heard. Yeah, but it's that so, argument. So, so, the argument is flawed. You think? In, in, in the argument itself. Because we, if we're okay. talking about illegal immigrants, they cannot vote for anyone. And by the time they right. can vote, it's going to be like 15, 20 years down the road. They're not even going to remember how to vote, probably. And, and, and well, in a matter of, <clears throat> it, it needs to be said, mm -hmm. people don't vote Democrat or Republican. Right. People vote with their stomach. Whomever is providing for them or right. allowing and, and, them. Okay. Right? And then going, going to your point. Yeah. Well, I don't want to politicize the discussion, but I think that, I, do, I, 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 do. I think I know you do, but I, I think <laughs> the Democratic Party has always been, like you said, to their stomach. They 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 provided more like humanitarian assistance. Yeah. Even even yeah. Even empathy. Like, yeah. We you're a human being. You're I get that you're undocumented. You're already in the country. Let's find a pathway to citizenship. Whereas, well, they don't. Where, whereas, I, and I don't want to. I don't. Get, I don't get, <laughs> you're very good. You're very good. You yeah. got me into this. this <laughs> This corner here, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get out of it, right? <laughs> so, so the conservative side is more like for border protection. Um, hey, both sides have a valid point. I'm, this is me trying to get out of this. No, that's this, right. that's, that's this okay. position because you've put me I, in. Right? I am, I'm, a, I'm an independent thinker, right. Right. and I am an independent. I'm not in any, any of those, those of two course, parties. Of course, of course, you are, Myra. Why? Right. Because I saw both uh, of their intentions, which is right. none of them were good for the immigrant because it was just right. as a matter of just trying to use it as a political pond That's and the immigrant you know it's just a, it's just a human sadly, being trying to survive yeah. a bad sadly situation they right. thought well right. i go this way or the, and, i'll go and, that way yeah. but one thing is for sure right. uh the human being needs to know this to feel that they can do it on their own not giving them some sort of a bread you know breadcrumbs and that's what some parties have done just trying to say i'll give you because you cannot you cannot do it yourself so you have to depend on me do you think that's uh what one party is doing you're saying that's what the one party but, has but, done but don't okay but don't you isn't that and, and i'm not talking about permanently yeah but for a small period of time mm -hmm. when you have a group of people that are vulnerable coming into an, a country that have to assimilate correct don't you think that it's a good thing 
that they're assisted for this transition period and then no, uh, no? absolutely wow. not really? absolutely not wow. if you if one person left <coughs> their country mm -hmm. to go an adventure and go to another country legally or illegally right. that person have to be responsible enough to just you know front whatever it comes not waiting for a handout because they but, 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 but why absolutely not but we're not no. okay no. okay so yeah. what, what <laughs> What do you mean by handout? Okay, like it's a handout. I'm talking about uh, aid. No, I'm talking about no. There's no the <laughs> aid cannot be allocated for people who are not didn't work it, I didn't understand. work that because the people who worked for that little cushion of money yes. will 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 be will right. be upset that the money you is not invested. You them. have to come back. You okay, have to come okay. back because I want to finish this discussion, okay? We didn't even talk uh, about it. You know, women empowerment. That, that's for next time. We ran out of time. This is very interesting. No, no, no. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. we got to finish this discussion for us. Yes. Really <laughs> Thank you for watching MDC TV on Comcast Channel 78 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. And please be sure to visit our website where you can watch previously recorded episodes. Thank you.